Oh no! I think I'm gonna fall! Ah, you better not! Here I go! Ah! Secret of Mana may not be the most famous or highly rated RPG of its era, but it does seem to leave a strong impression on those who play it. And with the collection of Mana now available worldwide and a physical release coming this month, fans can play it along with its prequel, and more importantly, its never-before-localized sequel. So how do these games hold up? Is the collection worth $40? And how does this Secret of Mana compare to the 3D remake from last year? I'll answer all of these questions and more with science. The first game in the collection is Final Fantasy Adventure, or Mystic Quest, or Seiken Densetsu, depending on where you live. But as the American name suggests, the game was a Final Fantasy spin-off designed to hybridize action and RPG gameplay. For the most part, it plays like a top-down Zelda, but with a few standard RPG mechanics. You gain XP and level up when defeating enemies, learn spells to attack and heal with, and occasionally join up with partner characters with varying levels of usefulness. To make the combat more strategic, a bar fills in between your attacks. Allowing the bar to fill all the way will enable you to unleash more powerful attacks, but the fill rate is so pathetically slow at the start of the game that you may as well ignore it. But as you level up, the bar increases in speed and becomes a much more important mechanic, incentivizing you to hang back and wait for windows to attack instead of just swinging away wildly. You'll also need to switch between a variety of different weapons according to the enemies you're fighting or the obstacles that need to be cleared on the overworld. Around this time, Square was experimenting with the active time battle system in the main Final Fantasy games to make RPG combat less stiff, but this Zelda-like approach works so well that I'm surprised it didn't appear in more of their games. The world is fairly large, and while you're generally given an indication of where to go, the path is filled with twists and turns and some exploring is required to get around them. There's a good balance between being open while still being intuitive enough to find your way around without much trouble. Like Zelda, you usually reach a village and then enter a nearby temple to defeat a boss before repeating the process. That's about all there is to it, which in this case isn't a bad thing. I'm generally not a fan of 8-bit games even though I grew up on them, because developers hadn't quite figured things out like, don't kill the player when going through doors yet. There's some of that kind of frustration to be had here, but the game is still very playable. You're awkwardly limited to just four directions with no diagonal movement, but it doesn't take long to get used to. The more annoying problem is that your character automatically interacts with people and objects on contact, which will often leave you trapped behind characters spouting long dialogue strings over and over, or treasure chests that effectively block your way forward. Navigating the interface is also tedious enough that I started getting tired of swapping weapons around by the end of the game. The game is also prone to rapidly killing you off with no warnings about low health, so you need to keep a constant eye on the HUD and save often. The game does have a surprisingly generous save system that allows you to save anywhere and restart from that very room, albeit sometimes on top of an enemy. As long as you have a recent save, there's little reason to be frustrated when losing battles. I did this a lot. The music and visuals aren't anything too special, but the game does have a simple charm about it. Having only played the 16-bit sequels before, it almost feels like a modern, fan-made demake of those titles. I wouldn't recommend it to everyone, but if you're a fan of the later games, then it's well worth a play. It's certainly held up far better than the first Zelda or Metroid games have. That said, the sequel executes the same basic idea better in almost every way. You can now move diagonally and dash across the screen, and the weapon swapping has been streamlined with a faster ring menu. The attack bar has been revamped so that it fills quickly right from the start, but attacks below 100% will deal very little damage and are mostly pointless. Special attacks are now done by charging up, with eight different levels each offering a unique attack. The weapons themselves have a separate XP system and will level up the more your character uses them. In fact, basically everything in the game has XP, to the point where there's just too much stuff to level up. The magic spells in particular take a lot of grinding to keep up with. The partner characters are integrated in a much more meaningful way and, in a totally unique twist, can be controlled by two other players. It's not just a throwaway feature, either. I would liken the game to Resident Evil 5 in terms of how much co-op transforms the experience for the better. Mainly because it's just a lot of fun to play an RPG with other people, but also because the AI is very dumb and prone to getting stuck on the environment, which holds your entire party back. Along with the action elements, three-player co-op is one of the features that really makes this game stand out from the other RPGs of its time, so if you can play it with other people, that's the best way to experience it. The atmosphere is another major reason the game is as beloved as it is. It's a shock to see these vivid, practically fluorescent colors after coming from the monochromatic prequel. The world is filled with little flourishes that make it seem alive, from the rustling grass to the flickering shade of a canopy or the purple swooshes of sword swings. 
Everything in the game is overflowing with color and style. The music is the very best part of the game. Hiroki Kikuda really understood the SNES sound chip and made a score that focused on a few high-quality samples, which he created himself, with the other channels using lower-quality sounds to produce background texturing. The resulting compositions have a lot of complex layering, but still manage to be incredibly catchy and hummable. It's not only one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard in terms of its own quality, but also how well it suits the character of the game, or maybe even defines it. There's an innocent quality that pervades the entire story. Even in the darkest segments, there are moonwalking zombies with cartoon facial expressions. The game makes me feel like a kid sitting on the floor in front of my Super Nintendo again, and it's not nostalgia. I never played the game as a kid. It just has an ability to transport you back to that place. Unfortunately, the game suffered from development problems that harmed the final product. The game was intended for the CD add-on Nintendo was developing with Sony at the time. It didn't go anywhere or produce anything worthwhile. When that project fell through, the game had to be condensed to fit on a 16 megabit cartridge, with as much as 40% of its content being cut. The game has a lot in common with Wind Waker in that regard, and much like that game, you can kind of sense where something is missing. One temple turns out to be a 10 second trek through space and nothing else. And again, like Wind Waker, the game has a pretty gnarly fetch quest that sends you all over the world and back half a dozen times, with each return trip requiring a trek up the same mountain. I suspect that they originally had more organic ways of leading the player around the world that had to be cut and replaced with this platypus just telling you where to go. The game is also rife with glitches that become pretty annoying by the end. Characters will often lock up and fail to execute the commands you give, which will frequently result in party members dying because a healing spell never came through. Maybe half of the boss fights are poorly balanced and end up looking like this. Not only is spamming magic the fastest way to win these fights, it's the sanest way. A lot of these enemies are difficult or impossible to hit with other attacks, so you'd just be standing around waiting for nothing. Because of these faults, I think Secret of Mana objectively isn't as good as rival RPGs like Chrono Trigger, but the game is so overwhelmingly likable that it makes up for it. It is again like Wind Waker, a very flawed game that ends up being a lot of people's favorite anyway by virtue of how appealing it is. I'd recommend it to practically anyone, even those who don't really care for RPGs, since it plays so much like A Link to the Past. If you can be patient with its shortcomings, the game is incredibly memorable and fun. If you were to remake Secret of Mana, you'd ideally want to do justice to the music and visuals that shaped it so much while also fixing the major gameplay problems, and I think even the biggest fans agree that it has major problems. Square took the bold step of releasing a remake that makes almost everything worse and costs several times more. The game is cheap with a capital, they didn't give a shit about this game. You know what you're getting into when the game has absolutely no visual options and requires meddling with the EXE to set the full screen res. Square previously remade Final Fantasy Adventure on mobile phones for $14, and they delivered a similar level of quality here, even reusing the mobile assets, in spite of the fact that this wasn't a mobile phone game and cost $40. And even if you ignore the Steam and PS4 releases and just consider it a Vita game, I did a review not that long ago gushing on about how great Ocarina of Time 3D looks, and that game was made for even less powerful hardware. You can pull off great visuals on any system if the art direction is strong enough. This is a good example of what's wrong with the remake. The original architecture is carefully detailed and shaded. There are keystones, rounded turrets, and a different layer of bricks for the trim. The shadows aren't just darkened, but shifted to a bluish-purple hue, which was part of the style of the game in its sequel. It all gives the castle a surreal appearance, like it's frozen in time in some other world. The problem with the remake isn't how faithful it is, but the care put into it. There are just a few blocky polygons with a brick texture slapped on. There's substantially less attention to detail, which is something you can see across the game. The cuttable grass is just a flat texture. The canon travel animation showing the world map is cut out. A lot of the enemy designs miss the point, like the flower enemies that don't really blend in as flowers. A lot of the effects and details that made the original game special just aren't bothered with. Then there are just weird inclusions that remind me of a bad texture pack, where someone snuck in anime characters for no reason. The water effects tend to look really nice, but as a whole the game feels as basic and cheap as it can be. It reminds me a little of Cave Story 3D, where you go from really charming 2D visuals to really cheap 3D graphics for no real reason. To say something nice about the graphics, the world map is definitely a lot better than the original Mode 7 version. The piloting controls really suck, but I'm trying to give the game something here, the map at least looks great. The main character models also look nice, but other models can look bizarre and out of place. This is troubling. 
I'm not sure why Gemma has a giant silly head when other characters aren't proportioned that way. Every model looks bad when the voice acting starts, though. Yes, sir. This is the most bizarre decision in the remake. Every little character is voiced, which is an impressive undertaking, but not one that a game with such a strained budget has any business attempting. It's painfully obvious that the same voices are being used across dozens of characters, usually without matching a single one of them. One night is 5 GP. One night is 15 GP. One night is 50 GP. This is all because you removed the sword. Go away! This is all because you removed the sword. No one would have held it against a cheap remake of an old game to just use text boxes. Were they trying to make the game more epic and cinematic? And if so, why did they travel back in time to hire actors from the PS1 era? Whoa! I saw a white dragon up in the mountain! Yeah! Leave here now! Help! Monsters have surrounded the village! Dancing has begun! I join in! I'm sure King Truffle would be willing to help you! Wandering out of the house! Pet. Where are you? Who's a spy? I'm not convinced that one isn't text-to-speech. Who's a spy? <laughs> and why didn't they bother to animate the characters' mouths? This wouldn't have been an issue if the camera had kept at a distance, but they paste the models over the screen in a larger view and zoom right up into their faces so that you can get a detailed look at the details they didn't put in. The cutscenes are also full of sloppy mistakes like single-frame jumps or dropped models. I've never considered the story to be a great asset to the game, but the entire narrative is less effective when delivered this way. The gameplay animations are no better. You can get away with just a few frames of animation when using sprites because your imagination is already filling in so many details. But in a 3D remake, where more fluid animations should be a major part of the point, the game still uses the SNES movements and it looks extremely janky. The combat feels slower and laggier in 3D even though it's not terribly far off from the original. The developers also apparently thought it was okay to have the characters form a horrific amalgamation of body parts every time a new area loads. This is even scripted to happen during important cutscenes. There's absolutely no polish here at all. As cheap as the visuals are, there are still areas of the game that look okay. It always looks like a mobile game, but it doesn't always look bad. The audio, on the other hand, is an absolute train wreck. Some of the sound effects are so out of place and delivered with such perfect timing that it becomes comedy. And to learn more abilities. Are these bees supposed to be punching like this? Are they okay? Sometimes the timing is so far off, it's like they dropped a sound in the general area it needed to go and left it as is. The music was apparently handled by a team of, correct me if I'm wrong here, over a dozen different people, and it sounds like they were blindfolded, spun in circles, and sent into different rooms without ever being told what the plan was. The soundtrack doesn't seem to know whether it wants to be hyperactive pop music, huh? cheesy prog rock, or sappy orchestral pieces. Those perfectly chosen samples from the original have been replaced with shrill, bagpipe-like screeching and dubstep noises. I literally had to take breaks to prevent myself from getting a headache. Hiroki Kikuda supervised the remixes with the idea that everyone would take their own direction and it didn't really work out. It especially seems like a missed opportunity given the number of great renditions on the internet. My favorites come from a channel called Orchestral Fantasy. I've been watching his videos for a few years, and at this point he's done most of the soundtrack to the game, and every time he absolutely nails it. Just one fan working for free on YouTube did a much better job than an entire team of composers. You can switch back to the original score, and I suppose the game deserves credit for not locking it behind a DLC paywall. But if the visuals are so cheap, and if the only saving grace of the new soundtrack is that you don't have to listen to it, why buy this? The gameplay improvements would have to be pretty major to make this worth playing, and the answer there is not really. The best addition is the ability to change directions while running, which makes the original game feel really stiff in comparison. I'm also fond of the option to carry more items. 
The original limit of four was very strict and made it necessary to travel to stores and refill after every big battle. You can still choose to use it, but eight items feels like a better balance and matches up more closely with the sequel. I always want remakes to make changes like this optional, and this is perfect. You can map your frequently used spells to hotkeys so that you can use them right away. It seemed buggy and randomly forgot the assignments, but it's still a convenient feature to have. The rest of the changes feel like a step forward and backward at the same time. The bosses have been made much easier, which I don't have a firm opinion on. Some of the original battles could be very tough and frustrating and maybe could have used a little tweaking, but they pushed too far in the other direction by making them a cakewalk. The new versions often ended so quickly that it took me by surprise. The AI of your partners has not been improved one iota and they're every bit as likely to get stuck as ever. You actually lose some control over them since you can't set their aggressiveness to the same degree as the original, so if anything they're actually dumber. You're at least able to move on when they get stuck, but they never catch back up to you, which often leaves you fighting alone while your teammates are doing god knows what probably dying. Your arrows can fire farther, which makes the bow more unique and useful as a weapon, but enemies can also fire farther, and through walls and from off-screen even, which makes segments with archers a cheap nightmare. Magic spamming has been made slightly slower, but not enough to make any meaningful difference. Overall, the game does play better, but not by nearly enough to warrant buying a $40 remake for. Again, like Wind Waker, the remake leaves the biggest problems untouched and puts a band-aid on a few smaller issues. The original game coasted by on the strength of its atmosphere, and the remake's degradation of that quality makes the gameplay improvements seem even less worthwhile. The most damning thing I can say about the remake is that fan patches have brought its best changes to the original, sometimes in better forms. You can leave your teammates behind and they will catch up. You can run in all directions, carry more items, and even set hotkeys for spells. There are additional improvements beyond what the remake did, like being able to cut down obstacles with any melee weapon instead of having to switch to a specific few, and making spells easier to level up without grinding. If you want a better playing version of Secret of Mana without compromising any of the game's character, this is it. I'll admit that I was biased against the remake right from the start because the reception I got at launch was too negative to ignore. The game had rampant crashing and glitching issues because Square was apparently too cheap to even hire bug testers. A lot of the worst issues have been patched, but I was still surprised by just how cheap and careless the remake is. What surprised me the most is how much I enjoyed playing it in spite of all the faults. I guess Secret of Mana is such a fun game that even a bargain bin remake of it can be a good time. It's a little like a $1 frozen pizza. It's bad, but you can have a good time eating it. Only in this case, the price doesn't match the quality. This is the most expensive and in my opinion worst way to experience Secret of Mana. If you have $40 burning a hole in your pocket, buy the collection, or spend a little more to get an SNES classic. This remake is garbage. I said it's garbage! Oh. Getting back to the collection, the final game is Seiken Densetsu 3, now rebranded as Trials of Mana. The new translation is very different from the fan version, and while I can't comment on the accuracy of it, the new font better matches the density and pace of the Japanese game. A lot of the things you would have expected to be censored are not, and aside from some of the menu icons being changed, it seems like the game content is totally untouched. This entry is widely considered to be the best in the series, and there are a lot of good reasons why. There were no CD shenanigans, and it was developed for a large 32 megabit cartridge right from the start. The game is much less buggy and awkward than its predecessor, although there are still a few issues that remain in this release. The dexterity stat and critical hits have never really worked, making any leveling towards those things a waste. But it is a much more solid and better balanced game, especially when it comes to the bosses. This time you can carry 9 items, which allows the fights to be longer and more intense than before. They're all on the verge of being too long, but the challenge is much more satisfying now that you're not just spamming magic. You really need to coordinate your attacks and spells between party members to pull through most of these fights. There's a storage system that allows you to hold hundreds of items in reserve, but you can't access it during battles. It's a clever way to save you from the constant restocking of the last game without making the fights any easier. And like the Secret of Mana remake, you can also run in all directions and your teammates won't hold you back when stuck, although their pathfinding is much better this time and they usually do catch up. Multiplayer is still in the game, but limited to just two players this time. This may not have been much of a loss back when the multi-tap accessory was required, but on a system like the Switch, where connecting controllers is easy, it does feel like more of a downgrade. You can choose from six characters at the start of the game, and the selection matters a lot, for both gameplay and story reasons. 
Depending on who you choose, you'll begin and end the game in different areas and experience a different storyline. The characters are also radically different in their abilities. For example, Kevin is a werewolf with some of the best fighting skills, punching twice with each attack, and he becomes even more powerful at night. Charlotte can't attack well and instead relies almost entirely on magic to support her teammates. So not only do you have to think about your main character, you also have to put together a team that will balance out well. You can get into trouble by choosing without knowing what you're doing, and this is where the collection starts to come up a little short. The original Japanese release came with a massive manual which Square has put online, but it almost certainly won't be translated into English, so you'll definitely want to Google the characters to get the gist of them before starting up. Square wanted the characters to have more distinct fighting styles, so they're each locked to the weapon they start with and can't use anything else. This ends up making the battles less varied and interesting since you're basically attacking the exact same way the whole game. The problem is made worse by the new battle system. You still have a fill gauge, but the game no longer displays it. Instead, your character will signal that they're ready to attack again with an animation. Landing attacks in a row will let you charge bars at the bottom of the screen until you've earned enough to perform a special attack. There are only three of these attack levels to unlock, with the third coming late in the game, so you're basically limited to performing just a few attacks over and over. This is a lot less free than the charge-up system from Secret of Mana, which allowed you to get as many as 9 different attacks out of each weapon for a total of, I think, 72 attacks. The fighting feels slower and more routine as a result. Your characters will go into a battle mode when enemies are near and you'll lose the ability to run, which makes it a slog to pass through areas full of minor enemies you don't want to fight. Your characters also tend to take their weapons out late or put them away while the fight is still going, which seems like a step down from the way that Secret of Mana handled things. That said, the fighting is still a lot of fun and the balancing is much more consistent than the previous two games. Visually, the game is a major step up and represents some of the best pixel art from the SNES. The game has a darker, more mature look with even more attention to detail. Objects are shaded more heavily to give the appearance of more 3D depth, and colored lighting is used everywhere to add highlights or bounced light from other objects. The colored shadows of the last game are much bolder and used to a greater effect. There are perspective tricks like a curved horizon and high areas that make the sense of space much greater. The cutesy innocence that made Secret of Mana so endearing has been traded in for a more mature style that's operating on a higher level, both technically and artistically. The soundtrack is also much more somber and muted, and while it may not be as catchy as the last game, it also represents a technical leap. Kikuda pushed further with the samples he was able to create by limiting himself to only six instruments, increasing the quality of each. The resulting sounds are unlike anything I've heard from the Super Nintendo before. I find that the game takes more time to grow on you than Secret of Mana, but it is ultimately the better experience. The atmosphere is very different, but every bit is well crafted, if not better, and the gameplay is more ambitious without suffering from any major faults. It took 24 years for this game to finally be released outside of Japan and it apparently only happened because Square was already translating the script for the upcoming remake, which thankfully looks like a $60 game this time. If you've never played Trials of Mana, don't wait for the remake to come out to start it. The original holds up perfectly and deserves to be played just as it is. Between these three titles, there's no shortage of quality gameplay to be had, but is it $40 worth? Going by the rates Nintendo set with the Virtual Console, which some have argued were already too high, these three ROMs should be $20. And if you think it's unfair to describe this as a collection of ROMs, well, that's literally what it is. People have extracted them and they're all in the standard ROM formats. The Trials of Mana ROM had to be translated and patched and that wasn't a small job, so if they wanted to jack it up to 30, that would have been fair. At $40, I want a little bit more than what the collection is offering. If you're the kind of person who just wants to hit the on button and play the game, then you won't care about any of this, and I wouldn't be holding it against the game if it didn't cost this much, okay? The borders for the games can't be changed, and in the case of Final Fantasy Adventures, the bright colors can distract from the monochromatic game window. Letting users choose a black border couldn't possibly have been a hard thing to add. The visual options for this game are pretty decent, at least. There's a Game Boy screen that looks really authentic, a black and white mode with better clarity, and something that resembles a Game Boy color palette, each with the option to use either integer or full screen scaling. I kept cycling between them and couldn't settle on one since they all look good in their own way. Unfortunately, the 16-bit games don't get much to work with. There are just two modes, raw pixels and a mostly identical one that looks like it has bilinear filtering. Other options like CRT filters can look really nice for these games, and even Nintendo has been offering that on their recent platforms. 
The games also don't let you choose the aspect ratio. This is getting deep into nerd territory, but the pixels you saw on a CRT with the original hardware were wider than they were tall, which meant that the sprites were horizontally elongated and couldn't display as perfect circles or squares. This made shapes like Samus's Morph Ball or the ring menu in the Mana games look more like squashed ovals. The 4-3 setting on modern emulators recreates that stretched look. When using 8-7 or 1-1 instead, the pixels aren't stretched and these shapes become perfect circles, which is what they're obviously supposed to be. It gets a little more complicated when considering that developers often drew large cinematic screens narrow to compensate for the 4-3 stretch, but the short answer is that 1-1 one -one will give sprites the correct proportions most of the time. That's why Mario Maker uses it for the old visual styles instead of 4-3. This is an extremely simple thing that even the most obsolete emulators let you change, and it's another thing that Nintendo has been offering with their recent systems. And when Nintendo is outdoing you with emulation options, it's not a good sign. If I wanted to really stretch this argument, I could bring up the advancements BSNES has begun to make, like widescreen in HD Mode 7. None of this is to say the collection is bad, just that emulators have gotten really, really good. And like most official releases, M2 isn't doing much to compete with them here. And I think it's fair to bring this up since emulation was required to play Trials of Mana for so many years. There are a lot of cool things that can be done to enhance old games and M2 isn't doing much of it here. You're getting bare bones emulation and a sound test. They give you three save state slots, but they also replace your regular save files when loaded, meaning that loading an older save state will erase all of your current progress in the game, which makes it less useful. Including the original manual and artwork also would have been a great addition, since that kind of supplemental content is the exact kind of thing an official release can offer that an emulator can't. If you've never played these games before, or don't currently have access to any of them, the collection is very worth the money in order to get good, if plain, versions of them. If you're already familiar with the games and have versions you're happy with, then it might be a tougher sell, since there's not really much here that you don't already have. Of course, if you want to play Trials of Mana legally, you don't have a choice. The main reason I bought this was just to finally pay for the game, which felt nice. But now I'd rather go back to emulating it rather than playing it on the Switch. It's still the best official release these games have gotten, but it could have and should have been a little better at this price. On the sheer quality of the games, I'd give it 9 tingles, but they're sad. And if you like video game covers, please check out Orchestral Fantasy's channel. It's loaded with great performances from Zelda and other series and deserves the views.